All right, um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Holly Schreiber. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the fossils we find in Western New York. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So let's see here. All right. So um, I'm the Director of Education at Penn Dixie Fossil Park and Nature Reserve. If you are unfamiliar with Penn Dixie, we are located in Hamburg, New York, and it's just south of Buffalo. And today, you know, I'll be focusing on Penn Dixie and the rocks and fossils we have, but really it, um, around most of Western and Southern New York, you'll find very similar rocks, very similar fossils. Okay, so um, here is a picture of um, part of our site of our quarry. Um, this is one of the drainage channels and I will actually come back to this um, picture a little bit later when we're talking about um, the rocks. So um, Penn Dixie has actually quite a long history. Um, that it was a rock quarry from about the 1950s to about the 1970s. And um, during that time, the Penn Dixie Cement Company actually quarried the rocks to make cement. And um, that cement went into the roadways of the area. Well, unfortunately, um, or fortunately for us, um, that company went out of business in about the mid 70s. And the quarry kind of laid vacant for oh, about 20 or so years. And um, was just this big open space in the middle of a residential area, as you can see from this Google map here. Um, and some partying and some nefarious activities went on there during um, the late 70s and early, um, into the 80s. But we were preserved in the mid-1990s. And the, the way we were preserved was because geologists in the area, along with a group of neighbors who wanted to see this area used for um, something good, uh, preserved our park along with the town of Hamburg. And um, the town of Hamburg stipulated that our park was um, to be an educational facility. And we had to clean up all the garbage that people had dumped there um, in, about, in the 20 years from the time the cement company um, ended their ownership of the land and we took it over. So Penn Dixie is actually um, entering its 25th season. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had um, the 25th season that we thought we would given that, um, given the COVID-19 situation, um, but I'm happy to announce that we are opening um, for members starting on Monday, June 1st and non-members on the 15th. So we're excited to actually get out there and dig for fossils. All right, so let's get to the fossil part. Um, you're probably seen a map similar to this. This is the generalized bedrock of um, geology of New York. And I'm located here right where the big red star is. Um, but there's a couple things to take away from the, this map. All right, so you'll see that I'm on, the star is on the green rocks here. And that just means that these are um, Devonian in age. And again, I will get to what that means if you're unfamiliar with that. And it's what they're called sedimentary rocks. And again, I'll, I'll step, uh, come back to that. because I know we have some um, varying um, backgrounds that are listening to this talk. So you'll see that these green rocks stretch basically most of our state, southern part of our state here. And that's why I say I'll be focusing on Penn Dixie, but a lot of what today's talk will be about can um, be used for a good chunk of the southern portion of our state. So you'll also notice that most of our state is made out of, or, or the bedrock is, is sedimentary rock, except the orange and red up here, which are the metamorphic rocks. So since we're interested in fossils, we're gonna be focusing on those sedimentary rocks. Now, I mentioned the Devonian, and if you are unfamiliar with the geologic time scale, the Devonian period is a time um, roughly about 385 million years ago. 
Now there's a range, but um, our rocks here in Western New York are about 385 million years old. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with that number. And the Devonian period, the world looked really different. And if you can picture what the globe looks like today, you'll notice that it does not look like the map I have on the screen right now. Um, instead of the, the continents we have today, we have basically three large land masses. Okay, so Siberia to the north, North America and most of Europe on a single land mass that straddled the equator, and then the southern continent, so South America, um, Africa, and so on as a single land mass um, to the south. Western New York was right about where that star is on the map. Very different, again, from what we have today. So I believe we're at something like 43 degrees north today. Back in the Devonian, we were roughly, say, 20-ish or so degrees south of the equator. And um, through plate tectonics over the last 385 million years, the continents have shifted to where they are today. Okay. Now, if we focus in on that star and look at what's happening kind of in the regional level, we'll look at the, this map on the left first. And I apologize that it's a little bit grainy, um, but I wanted to make sure it was big enough on screen. And you'll see that in this tropical 20 or so degrees south of the equator location, you can see that this whole area was covered by water. And that's what gives us our very cool fossils today. And we'll get into that in a minute. So a couple things to note. Um, this ocean, this tropical ocean, covered not only southern part of New York, but down into Pennsylvania, into Ohio, over to Michigan, and so on. So remember, this is a big regional um, feature. A couple other things were going on during this time in the Devonian as well. Um, one major one was what was called the Acadian orogeny. Um, orogeny is just a fancy term for a mountain building event. So during the Devonian, roughly again 385 million years ago, these Acadian mountains were being formed. Now you may have never heard of the Acadian mountains. It's really just the third of four phases of the Appalachians. Okay so the Appalachians uh, formed over four distinct events and this was the third of those four. And if you see this um, line drawing over to the right. This is showing what's happening to form these Acadian mountains. So we have basically continental fragments that are being squeezed onto that landmass of North America and Europe. And as that squeezing is happening, these mountains are being pushed up. Um, and you can see that right here, kind of pushed up onto North America. Now to the west of those mountains, we have a basin, a depression at, due to that squeezing. And that's where this shallow tropical ocean is forming. And that's called the Catskill Basin. So you can see that here on the map on the left, as well as on the line drawing on the right. Okay. So um, that is why we have so many fossils here in, in New York, in Western New York. Um, not only did we have the shallow tropical ocean that was teeming with life, and I'll get into what that life is in a minute, um, it was the right conditions for fossilization. So if you imagine animals living in an ocean here, as these mountains rise up, they start to erode. A lot of that material gets washed into this um, Catskill Basin by rivers and streams. Um, also, we're, if you think about it, we were in the tropics during this time. What happens in the tropics? Massive storms like hurricanes. And we, um, we expect that these have happened in the past as well. 
So these storms and the this material being washed in from the mountains, they, they helped bury the animals that were living in this basin and therefore um, helped along the fossilization process. Okay. Now, if we look at the geology a little bit, and I won't spend too much time on this because we want to get to my favorite part, the fossils. That's what I'm interested in, um, even though I'm a geologist as well. Um, this is a generalized um, rock section at Penn Dixie. And again, you can find these rocks in a lot of places um, in Erie County and the surrounding counties um, in Western New York. So I'll show you some pictures of these on the next slide as well. Okay, so if we look at the oldest member that we have at Penn Dixie. Um, it is this Wanaka Shale member. And um, remember, these are uh, forming in that basin. So we know that the Wanaka Shale member here, um, it's described as a thinly bedded shale, gray in color. And it we think it formed in moderately deep water. So we're not talking like a beach environment. We're not talking the deepest parts of the ocean. Okay, so moderately deep water. It has lots and lots of fossils in it. And I'll give you examples of those as we go along as well. Um, but unfortunately, the way the geology works, especially in our area, the this Wanaka shale gets saturated with water. Therefore, the fossils get very um, waterlogged and therefore they become delicate. And you can get some beautiful fossils out of here, but um, sometimes they just disintegrate because they are waterlogged. Okay. Now, above that, you can see another layer here. And we're moving into the Moscow formation, which is the, the kind of the meat and potatoes of the, the rocks at Penn Dixie here. Um, and the oldest part of that is what's called the Tishner limestone. And um, a limestone here, these, this is made out of um, the secretions of the, the fossils that or the animals that became the fossils living there. Um, it's tan in color, it's weather um, resistant to weathering, and um, it's fossil rich again, just like the Wanaka. Um, however, we know based on today and um, studies in the past that limestones generally form in um, shallower water and, and nearer to shore. So we're getting shallower as time goes on from the Wanaka to the Tishner. Another uh, piece of evidence that shows that the water was shallower here is that we can see oxidation happening on the top edge of the Tishner limestone. Um, so at some point in the past, water completely drained away from this area okay, and allowed the iron to, to basically rust or oxidize. Okay. Now, what most people dig in, in Appendix E at least, and in a lot of areas in the area, uh, a lot of different fossil collecting areas around Western New York is the Wyndham Shale. And it's a shale again, so made of tiny bits of clay and mud. Um, and you can see it makes up the bulk of um, our strat section at Penn Dixie. So probably something like 10 plus meters in, um, in depth. Okay. And I'm just going to touch on a couple really rich fossil beds. One is right here at the bottom. It's labeled number um, one, and it is the Bayview coral bed. And the Bayview coral bed is very, very rich in fossils. Um, it's very soft, however, however, and very easily weathered. So it is just basically chock full of fossils, but they break up very easily. And um, it's thought that this was a death assemblage. So as their water currents are coming into this area when these animals died, it was mixing them up, breaking them up and depositing them in this one location. 
And so you'll get basically just masses of fossils, one on top of each other. Okay. Now, Pendixie is one of the few places in Western New York that you can access this um, Bayview coral bed. Um, it's not accessible in many places around the region. Right above this, you'll also see a very resistant layer, and that is called the Smoke Creek trilobite bed. And as the name suggests, it is rich in trilobites. Um, many fossil hunters in our area are really into um, trilobites. And so people come and look for this specific bed, the Smoke Creek trilobite bed, which is um, found in, in other parts of Erie County and the surrounding counties in Western New York. Okay. Um, but we'll get into the fossils, um, the trilobites and everything in just a minute. But as you move up through this Wyndham Shale, you kind of lose some of the fossils. This whole area in between here is, is kind of devoid of fossils, or at least they're very, very sparse until you get to the top, down right around five and six, where um, we find some pyrotized fossils. Now, other places in New York, you can find pyrotized fossils that are beautiful and big and gold. Um, the pyrotized fossils at Pendixie in this part of the Wyndham Shale tend to be very, very small. Um, it can be things like bivalves or gastropods or even ammonites but they're very small. And so given the small size and the fact that they're pyrotized, that suggests that this was a deeper environment, ocean environment, and also probably lacking in oxygen or, or completely devoid of it. Okay. And then lastly here, for the last two, these limestone members, the um, North Evans and Ganundua, um, I'm just going to mention them. They're not well exposed at Pendixie. They're vegetated. Um, you know, trees and vegetation are often um, kind of the nemesis of fossil hunters and geologists. So we don't really do too much hunting in these limestone members. Um, the same with the West River Shale. Um, that is very heavily weathered um, and also vegetated. All right, so back to this picture that you saw at the beginning. Um, so this is one of the main digging areas and you can see that Wanaka Shale here um, below this red line, the Tishner limestone right there, and then the Wyndham Shale on top. And I think of it almost like an Oreo cookie, right? The, the two shales, the Wanaka and Wyndham, um, sandwich the Tishner. And you can see that that Tishner limestone is very resistant to weathering very blocky, very hard, um, and uh, makes a good marker in um, at the at the site. Okay. Now let's get to the fossils. I'm a paleontologist by training, so these are my favorite things. Um, so the most common fossil we have in Western New York are the corals. Okay, two types in particular: the horn corals here, um, also called rugose corals. And they can range in size anywhere from, you know, half an inch to the size of an ice cream cone. Um, and then we also have the tabulate corals. And so these are two different types of tabulate corals. You may have seen these little button um, corals here, which I do apologize. I should have had a scale on here to show you the difference and um, I forgot to do that. But these are called pleuridictum, and they're very common along the beaches in uh, Western New York um, and, and uh, other areas. And then this is the honeycomb coral. You've probably seen that as well. Um, both horn corals and tabula corals are completely extinct, but we think that they would have lived like corals do today. So they would have had tentacles. So here's a reconstruction of what a rugose coral would have looked like. And um, they would have had tentacles at the top, at the, the top of the ice cream cone, if you want to think of it that way. And that, those tentacles would have been used to collect food for the animal. Um, 
they would have lived in a similar type of environment as corals today. So shallow tropical environment. Again, that fits with what we know from the rocks and the paleogeography. And these corals are the most common corals you'll find, in, or um, most common fossils, excuse me, that you'll find in the area. Okay, so um, there are lots of different species of them um, and they are very, very abundant. Now, my favorite, I'm biased to the, bra bra uh, excuse me, brachiopods. Um, I studied brachiopods um, in school. And so I love them. I think they're great. And so brachiopods are in our oceans today. They are greatly reduced in abundance and diversity. However, um, here are some pictures of the fossils um, you can find at Pendixi. And this is just a small example of them. There are probably 15 plus species of brachiopods at Pendixi. Um, but like I said, they're still alive today and we um, know that they would have lived similarly in the past. So they live attached to the ocean floor by a fleshy stalk. Okay? And they look like clams, but they're not closely related. Um, they just have that same two valved or two shelled um, body structure. And they um, would have filtered the water in, around the coral. So if you can picture what this would have looked like, imagine corals and then the brachiopods living amongst the corals. Okay. So I'm going over the four most common. So, oops, and I mixed my numbers up here. Um, so I'm going over the four most common fossils. And um, the third most common are the crinoids. Crinoids are commonly called sea lilies. However, they're not plants. They are animals and um, they just superficially look like, like plants. And what we find fossil wise around Pendixie and other parts of New York are these small discs. And they're about the size of Cheerios. Um, usually they're discs like this or large um, sections of those discs stacked up on one another as this picture um, shows down here. When the animal is alive, it looks like this. And they're still in our oceans today. These discs that we find are making up this stalk right here. So if you imagine this, once this animal dies and starts to break apart, a single animal could produce, you know, hundreds potentially, hundreds, hundreds of discs. Um, and here's a picture of a, a living crinoid today. They didn't get very big. Um, in general, I think a meter would be about the biggest they would get. Um, there are extraordinary examples of, of them getting, you know, 100 feet in length in the fossil record, not in New York, but in other places in the world. But um, they are in our deep oceans today, especially these varieties with the stalks. Okay. Um, other varieties of crinoids without stalks live in shallower waters. If you ever want to see something cool, Google feather, um, feather stars, and you can see them swimming, the unstocked varieties swimming. Uh, crinoids are related to things like sea stars and sand dollars, sea urchins, um, a group called echinoderms. And these star shapes, like this example right here, the star shapes in the center give us that, that hint of who they're related to. Okay. Now, our last of the really common fossils that we have in Western New York are um, trilobites. So I'm not a native New Yorker. I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, I was thrilled when I took this job at Penn Dixie because, as I say, I got to be elbow deep in fossils every day, um, which is not um, easily done in a lot of other parts of our country. And 
Um, New York is known for trilobites. Um, so two common, well, one common trilobite appendixy is this guy right here, Eldridgeops rana. And um, you may have heard this trilobite called Phacops rana. The name changed a few years ago. Same fossil, just a name change. This other guy here is um, a genus called Bellicartridia. They are less common appendixy. So we have probably something like four or five common types of trilobites in the area. Uh, well, rel let's say four or five types of trilobites, one very common type, this Eldridgeops rana. Now, trilobites are pretty cool. They could, they used to, um, they're an extinct group. They could roll up like potato bugs or, or roly polies do today. Um, they could roll up to protect themselves. And so we find lots of fossils of trilobites rolled up. And this, um, this process of enrolling was for protection, just like roly polies do today. Um, and that protection could potentially have been from something like a predator or even to withstand um, those burying events, those, those big storms that would have rolled through the area um, back when these animals were alive. Okay. So trilobites in, um, in our region tend to be relatively small, a few inches at most. Um, other parts of, of Western New York um, and Southern New York and um, parts of the country, they get bigger. Um, there's different species that can get up to two feet in length. But very cool fossils. Unfortunately, they are, this group is extinct. Um, and uh, they, they are often um, the focus of fossil hunters that come um, to our region. So we've been talking about the four most common animals that are living in this coral reef environment. So if you can picture, think of like the Great Barrier Reef today, lots of corals, lots of life. Well, that's what this area would have looked like um, with slightly different animals. So think of um, instead of the stony scleractinian corals of today, we would have had the horn corals and um, the honeycomb corals. And then amongst that are the brachiopods, the trilobites, the cr crinoids. Um, very rich, very diverse, um, very abundant life. Now, these all were living on the ocean floor. There were predators swimming in the water too. These fossils are less common, but they are found in our area. Um, but just wanted to point out what was going up, going on up in the water column as well. So um, the predators at the time were cephalopods. So if you are unfamiliar with cephalopods, they're basically like squids with shells. And so they could have a long straight shell like this reconstruction right here. And here's the fossil of one or this kind of coiled shell here. Um, so these are the things like the ammonites um, the orthocone cephalopods you may have heard of. There were also armored fish in the area. Now, we didn't have this particular guy. This is Dunkleosteus, common in places in Ohio, but we had relatives of, of him. So these armored fish had bony plates on the outside of their body, you can see that right here, that would have protected it. And they grew very, very large. So we find just pieces of these bony plates at Pendixie. Um, they, we have yet to find anything substantial from an armored fish. Now, what does all this tell us about the past of Western New York? Um, I've already, you know, we've already been talking about that. This all tells us that it used to look like this. Now, this is an incredible artist reconstruction of the region. And this is based on the fossils of um, a long 18 mile creek. And um, so this would have, this is 
really representative of the whole region where we have these big coral reefs. We have trilobites scurrying around uh, amongst the coral, the brachiopods, um, these beautiful crinoids, sea lilies here with our predators swimming around. Okay, so very different than um, we have today. Now, we've been saying shallow tropical ocean. We don't know specific depths um, of the water. Um, we know it changed over time. The rocks tell us this, as do the fossils. But we could expect, on average, the depth of the water to be anywhere from about 100 to 150 feet. Okay. And remember, this all dates to about 385 million years, um, the time period of the Devonian. So this is about 150 million years before dinosaurs even evolved. So you're not going to find dinosaur fossils in our area. Our rocks are just way too old. Um, and um, I hate having to tell people that because they get so excited about finding dinosaurs, but um, unfortunately we don't have them in our area. Okay. Now, one kind of missing piece of the puzzle, as you saw in the earlier map, we didn't have, we had land off to the west and off to the east. Um, land in the Devonian looked very different than it does today. So land was just starting to be colonized by plants, um, insects, and really early tetrapods or, or four-legged animals. Um, as this picture shows here, um, it would have looked very different. Occasionally in our region, we find pieces of wood uh, that would have washed in from the shoreline. They're usually not very well preserved, um, but we see them once in a while. Okay. Now, thank you for inviting me. I'll, I'll answer questions if anybody has them. I just wanted to acknowledge that um, Pendixie is a small nonprofit um, and we um, are funded partially by Erie County, as well as the town of Hamburg. So thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thanks, Holly. That was a uh, great program. Um, I'm actually a geologist myself. Um, so from one geologist to another, that was great. Oh, thank you. Um, participants are all muted at this time. So if anyone out there has a question, you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, or if you're more comfortable typing it into the chat, I can read it aloud for you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing right now and then there we go. Holly, um, any plans for when Pendixie will open for the year? So right now we are considered phase one because we are a, an outdoor park. So we are opening to members starting June 1st and then um, non-members starting the 15th of, this, of, of June. And so um, we have some new procedures in place just to keep our staff and volunteers and of course our visitors as safe as possible. But we're really excited to open. It's um, super. It's been super. a while. We'll, we'll see you after the 15th. <laughs> yes, so after the 15th, all of our information is, our, is on our website um, about the new procedures and things like that. Super, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. So I see a chat, um, let's see here. See, do I have a favorite fossil in your collection? Well, like I said, I love the brachiopods. Um, they are my favorite because that's what I studied to get my PhD. Um, I just think that they have such great shell shapes um, that interested me evolutionarily. Like I liked how I like to study how they um, evolved those diverse shell shapes. Is there any um, other type of fossils in the New York spot that you're digging at? So we have some other things. Um, I did not have time to go over everything, but we have things like bryozoans, which are um, kind of kind of look like coral, but aren't very closely related. We have those ammonites, which are the squids with the shells, um, things like snails and clams as well. Um, 
And it's everything that lived in the ocean for the most part uh, during that time. And every once in a while, a piece of wood washes in. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Thanks. Holly, is it legal to uh, collect fossils in Allegheny uh, State Park? And if so, uh, where would you recommend to be hot fossil areas? In Allegheny? <laughs> I didn't think it was legal, was it? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm you know, kind of new to Allegheny Nature I'm, pilgrimage, so <laughs> I would I'm defer to you to, on that one. <laughs> I'm new to New York as well, relatively. Um, I thought it was not legal in state parks, but I don't know that for a fact. So I cannot answer that. I apologize. No, you're, I would guess that your uh, thought would be correct, but I figured I would ask. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I have one other question in chat. What does your my job entail other than being um, in the park? So I'm director of education. And so I'm in charge of basically all the programs on site, um, any sort of field trips that we have, like that they follow state standards. Um, I have research background as well. Um, and I would like to start doing research on some of the animals there, but um, if time hasn't allowed that yet. And so that's my goal to study some of the lesser known units in the rocks, like um, the baby coral bed is not that great, um, not well studied. Um, and most of the research in the area has dated back to some great papers, but they're already 30 or 40 years old. Um, so that's my ultimate goal, um, but we'll see if time allows that. Um, so yes, uh, so another question um, on chat, you are more than welcome to email me if you have any questions. I will do my best to answer them. Um, my email is on our website, but it's really easy to remember. It's hollyappendixy.org. Um, and uh, we are happy to help in any way we can. All right, if uh, no one else has any further questions, I think we'll uh, wrap it up. Uh, Holly, thank you so much for joining us and for that great program. Uh, thank you to all the viewers who have joined us and who have joined us for prior programs. We have two more programs on the docket tonight. Um, we have Nature Conservation at 7 and also Nature at Night um, at 9.30. Uh, if anyone's specifically interested in hearing a little bit more about uh, geology, um, my fiance, who is also a geologist, uh, will be giving his presentation tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. Um, so if you haven't registered for that, feel free to register uh, for that or any of our other upcoming programs at Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage com forward slash virtual ANP. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. All right. Thank you.